When Livingston Lord, the first uh, EIU president, came uh, to Charleston to take over this responsibility, he said, where's the residential component? Because he'd come from the University of Minnesota, where he had that, and he knew that was important. And he talked to the Board of Trustees about it and convinced them it was a good idea. So they forwarded that request to the uh, state legislature. He went over, presented the idea, and basically got laughed at. He said, what are you going to want next, a, a lunch counter? You know, because they thought that was ludicrous. He said, they said, we just don't do that in the state of Illinois. Well, he was obviously kind of taken aback by that, but he said, okay, how am I going to get this passed? And what he did in the second round in 1903, he connected with Stanton Pemberton, who uh, was a senator from Oakland, um, and he said, let's figure this out. In fact, Livingston Lord said, we have to do more than just educate them within the classroom. We have to make sure they develop the social graces that will be a major part of the position that they hold in their communities as educators. He was, from the very beginning, understanding the reality of not only the in-room and in-classroom education, but also what goes on outside the classroom. And in 1937, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was crisscrossing the country, visiting the CCC camps uh, that her husband had put in place by the New Deal. And in Charleston, there were three of them. And that evening, she came to Pemberton, and she stood in front of the fireplace and talked to the residents assembled about how lucky they were to have this opportunity to go to school. We had a reunion, a 100-year anniversary of the building. And we had a woman who was there, and she spoke about the most impactful uh, thing of her college experience of living in Pemberton Hall was sitting there listening to Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady of the United States in Charleston, Illinois, sitting in the formal lounge of Pemberton, telling them, uh, giving them life advice. The building is still a women's residence hall. In 1963, an addition was built uh, to add another 100 beds, so there's 200 beds in that building. Um, and the Cracker Box Gym, which was originally built, uh, is now the home of the Honors College. Um, and, and the building has uh, had some uh, renovations done to it, but done in a way that honors the historical significance of the building. And in fact, when you walk into it, you get the feel of, of uh, that 1909 opening uh, and what that felt like. Why this is an important story is because of the role that Eastern played in uh, the shaping of higher education in the state. Even though University of Illinois and Illinois State were universities 27 years before Eastern was, they didn't have a residential component that was part of the campus. Uh, as Livingston Lord said, um, you know, we're going to fight the fight for the state. Uh, but what was once a very unpopular idea will become popular indeed, um, as they will line up uh, to have their opportunity to become residential. And they did indeed, because it did uh, so much uh, enhance the education, not only just the um, uh, classroom experience, but also the out-of-classroom experience. In 1947, Lawyer's Flower Shop was started by Stanton and Vivian Lawyer. And their young daughter, Wilma, was just 11. And uh, the original location for the flower shop was at 1020 Lincoln Avenue. But in the 1960s, the highway came through. And so they had to relocate to 1518 11th Street. They built the flower shop on the back of their home which was very convenient. <laughs> um, and as their business flourished, so did their daughter. And Wilma soon learned the trade. And in approximately 1955, um, the flower shop officially became Lawyer Ritchie Florist because Wilma and Jim Ritchie joined Stanton and Vivian Lawyer. They soon started a family of their own and so then their children were raised in the flower shop. Uh, so there was three generations in one little flower shop. <laughs> and then in 1977, a new building was built in a new location, uh, 1100 Lincoln Avenue, where it still is today. So the story wouldn't be complete without mentioning Jim Ritchie. And uh, a lot of people probably don't realize that when he was younger, he did actually design 
um, but he's probably most known for delivering, and uh, you always knew he was coming. You just had to listen for the whistling. <laughs> Wilma's still there five and a half days a week, unless she's on vacation, which is very rare. <laughs> and now, um, well, she's known for her corsage work, but uh, she really loves to deliver and she loves to see the look on everybody's face. It's a wonderful feeling to bring fresh flowers to somebody and it just brightens up their whole day. Uh, most people know Wilma and Jim, Richie, but uh, a lot of people have asked where the lawyer comes from. And so there's a lot of people that don't realize that Wilma and Jim were actually second generation and that her parents were the ones who originally started the flower shop. Something that's very unique for today is that lawyer Richie Florist has never changed hands out of its own family. It's always been family owned and operated. Track was started in 1956 and it's ran continuously every year so this is our 59th year. It's the oldest club owned track in the United States. The seven men that started the local track with a $25 donation were Bill Fuquay, Everett Horn, Dwight Kingery, Bill McMahon, Cliff Prince, Paul and Dean Stanford. And that's what got the club started. It was a nonprofit corporation filed with the state of Illinois uh, September the 27th of 1956. And the first uh, track was temporary, sort of. It was on my father's uh, land uh, where the livestock auction was on West Route, what was known then as 316, just west of Charleston. It was there for the first year, 1956, and then they decided they needed a little bit more permanent track. Uh, things were starting to pick up, car count, spectators. So then it moved uh, east of Charleston, still on route at that time, 316, to the Monty in Elmer Popham farm. Uh, track was on his farm till I think 1961. It was a dirt track. Uh, 19, fall of 1961, they, uh, the club had enough money. They purchased approximately eight acres of land west of Charleston, about four miles, still on the old route today, 316. So it's always been located on route 316. And in 1962, they asphalted the track. The track was asphalt until 1984, and then dirt became more popular throughout the United States. Uh, so in 19, the fall of 1984, the asphalt was removed from the track, and uh, during that winter, in opening of 1985, the track was back to dirt again, uh, the same as it is today. The Coles County Club has held championship race, the national championship race in 1959, 1967, 1988, and the re most recent was 2006. One of the probably most famous drivers that we've had actually race at our track was Larry Rice from Linden, Indiana. In 1967, he was a school teacher, came over and set a new track record at the 1967 national race. And after that, he became a uh, USAC midget champion, a uh, USAC uh, dirt car champion. And then he uh, was the co-rookie of the year at the 1979 Indianapolis 500 with Rick Mears. So that's probably our most famous racer we've ever had. It's nice to see all the people. Today, the younger people that we get. We have a lot of eight to 14 year old boys and girls racing. Uh, so the sport's for everybody, and we even go up to probably about a 62-year-old person, man, that's driving still today. With my dad being one of the original members, and my father raced there, I've raced there, my son's raced there, I feel like, you know, it's like part of the family. And uh, we spent a lot of hours there, met a lot of nice people from all over the United States at different championship races. When I was a kid, I didn't realize you know, what the $25 donation would do and for how many years, how many people would enjoy the track, uh, how many people, younger people would learn to drive, learn mechanical skills from being there working on their cars. Uh, when I started racing there, the track was 10 years old, which to me seemed like it was forever. And then my son started racing there and the track was in the neighborhood of 30 years old. Now the track is going to be close to 60 years old.
My mom and dad are Reen and Bun Hutton. They started their life together in Mattoon, moved to Charleston when I was five years old. We had five children. They bought the farm and decided that they would try their hand at animals. So we had goats and sheep, horses, pigs, cows. I am one of five children. I am the next to the youngest. The oldest was Jerry, and then there was Pete, then Honey, then myself, and then my little brother Phil. There was a barn on the property, and they thought they had an idea. Probably mom came up with the idea, and then dad would help her see her ideas come to life. They put a wooden floor in the barn and started having square dances. That took off so well that they started having western swing dances on Tuesday nights. Then that went so well they had to add on to it more than doubled it on the north side and then they added to the back side of it and started having teen dances. We had Pete and Honey were old enough as teenagers so Pete was the bouncer and Honey's friends all came to the dances and they just, they just kept adding to the dances. On the day of barn dancing mom would be making all kinds of pies and her barbecue. She sold tenderloins and pop, coffee, pies and so it was a flurry of activity that day and then we'd all be carrying down the food and putting it in the kitchen. We had my brother Pete and his friend Flash Gordon, they called him, his name was Gerald. They would park the cars with flashlights and then they would come in and act as bouncers in case there were any problems, which there weren't many. She never allowed drinking. <clears throat> she made the teenagers sign in so that parents knew they were actually there if they said that they were. Um, it was just, it was fun. The, the floors would rock, it felt like to me. I was only 10 at the time when it started, but I have very fond memories. And the music was wonderful. Many people came from all over, Indiana, Terre Haute, Olney. We have a register that mom put their names and addresses in and she would send postcards out to them to invite them to come. And they just, they did look forward to it. There was even a square dancing magazine that she advertised in. On the square dancing nights, we had your traditional square dancing music. You even had, when you had the music play, you even had to have a caller that would tell you how to do the dance, promenade left, promenade right, that sort of stuff. And then on the teen nights, they had what was popular during that year, probably current music. This was a perfect fit for our family because our whole family loved to dance. My mom even had me stop the car one time and said, stop, I want to dance to that song. And we had to get out in the road and dance with my mother. And we danced in the house to the radio music all the time. If music was on, we are not sitting still. In 1854, a priest by the name of Father Thomas Ryan, he journeyed to Charleston through muddy, muddy roads in a horse and buggy. And he came to the home of a gentleman by the name of Mr. Munley, and he was an Irish immigrant, and he allowed um, the priest to say mass there. And then after that time period, he came, uh, Father Ryan came to Charleston, and he said mass on a monthly basis. So in 1865, a building that was across the street and used by, the, by a Christian church was across the street from the present um, church, our present church now, was acquired and used for purposes of staying mass and it became our church at that time. Um, but unfortunately in 1872 there was a bad storm and the fire uh, or that particular building, that church was damaged. A decision was made to build on that site and build another church by under the direction of Father Driscoll. It was it was interesting because there were farmers and there were railroaders and townspeople that came to help and they, wow, it's just amazing to me what, what they had to do. They went out to the Ambra River cliffs and they took the, they took the limestone from out there and they brought it 10 miles into town and then they dug the footings and they made deep holes to put this limestone slabs into to make the foundation of this church. So on May 26th in 1917, a lot of people know that a terrible tornado hit Charleston and Mattoon. Many, many people died, many people were injured, and many buildings were damaged. And our church, our church was also damaged. The windows were completely blown out. In 2011, we had the need to restore those same exact windows. 
Um, the cleaning and the restoration took several months. I've always thought those windows were beautiful. If I was going to be distracted in church, it was easy to be distracted by those windows, and that was it was good because they were they depict the story of Christ. We are just thankful that our forefathers were able to establish this parish and be conscious of our Charleston community and care enough about the people within it. I grew up in this church and I was born in Charleston at, and baptized at, at St. Charles and made my first communion and it's a wonderful church and I want to tell the story. Don Chafer is a um, longtime resident of this area. Um, he's um, been involved with, uh, well, he actually started giving blood back in 1955. Um, those units, four or five units, were not even counted back then because his, he was in the military. His base was next to a hospital. They would come over and ask him, um, ask the soldiers if they wanted to uh, donate blood for the people that needed it. And he started donating back then. When he got out of the Army, came back to America, he, uh, he never quit. And he's been donating for 60 years, basically. And he's uh, reached a level of giving that's only, I could only find one other person in life that's ever reached that level. And uh, he's just, when you meet him, he's just one of those guys you fall in love with. He's just a great guy. On July 12, 2015, Don Schaefer was recognized with giving his 30th gallon uh, blood, recorded blood actually. Don, Don does not do this for recognition. He does it because he knows the need is, is there. And uh, it's actually a God-given responsibility that we need to share to help each other, to help others. And Don's been a good example of that. On the, on the day of, um, that Don gave his 30th gallon, his 16-year-old grandson gave his second um, donation that was neat that his family came out supporting and the, uh, that they did, uh, that, that his grandson gave and his grandson wants to follow in the footsteps of his grandfather. So he's an inspiration to others. John Dom was a vital community member here in the Charleston area for many years. He touched a lot of lives. He was a mentor to not only myself, but to many people. And his mentoring and his touch on many people's lives is still rippling through the community and has taught many students uh, how to be leaders themselves in their community and are leaders in the Charleston community today. John Dom also uh, joined band when he was young. He was a trombone player and uh, had great role models in the band, high school band, because he sat third chair to two young men who later went on to be professional musicians. When John and his family moved to Charleston from Centralia, they, John was a band director here in the Charleston community for over 26 years. And during that time, he taught at the middle school, high school, and Jefferson. He drove his VW a bug around. That was his mode of transportation and kind of noted for that. John also had a huge role model when he was in Scouts. His Scoutmaster um, was a big part of his life. When John's oldest son, John Jr., uh, when they were here in Charleston, John wanted to make sure his son was in Scouts also. And John volunteered as a pot parent volunteer until the Scoutmaster here in Char Charleston retired, then um, John stepped up. Nobody else wanted the role, so John, of course, stepped up. John Dom was also on the Charleston uh, Recreation Board here in Charleston for 20 plus years. He was very involved with the pool and the improvements on the city pool, and he was also very involved. We had the band shell at Kiwanis, the white one, but when the city sewer line went through, they had to tear that down and John and some city officials were very instrumental in getting the awesome facility that we have now at Kiwanis Park. Because of the financial situation the school district was in, 
John wanted to see that there was avenues for musicians to continue. And so he started the Charleston Community Band back in 1977. Uh, I got to join that the fall of 79, and um, when John wasn't able to continue, um, I told him that I would continue that. In 2012, the band shell that is at Kiwanis Park in Charleston was dedicated to John Dom for all of his years of service, for his mentoring of many musicians, for his starting of the Charleston Community Band. The night of the dedication was uh, very special for not only John and his entire, almost entire family, but for all of us as musicians and people that he had touched our lives in a special way. Um, the night for the concert, I chose most of John's favorite songs, and he sat there and tapped his foot and, and was just uh, enjoying every moment of it. Um, it was a warm evening like most of our concerts are, but a lot of people spoke highly of all the things that have John, John has done in their community and how their lives were touched. His passion was to um, teach and to be a good leader and to instill life lessons to students and be a good role model to them, whether it be through music or scouts or through the rec board. John touched a lot of lives in a positive way. I believe that if John was here today seeing us tell the story, he'd not want us to be doing it in the first place because he didn't want the recognition. He worked hard and he just wanted to touch lives because he had great role models growing up and he wanted to touch lives in the same way. touching on every emotion tonight. We're excited in mm -hmm. here. That was a very touching story right there. I mean, everybody knew Mr. Dom. Him riding around in that Volkswagen, we knew that we had to get a hold of that picture because <laughs> that was him. He was awesome. Speaking of supporting and all the different people out there that are awesome, we have some people to thank tonight. Sure. Dale and Pat Kingery from Charleston. They're my relatives. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Jay Phipps, he is here for his CHS class of 45 years. He played golf today with the Inyards, so thank you, Jay Phipps. Mitchell Schick, his mother is one of the authors of Round the Square. Thank you so much for calling. Gary Brinkmeyer, he's one of our storytellers. Mm -hmm. Gail Pos... Oh, I don't know. Poscrate? Gail from Charleston, we thank you for calling in. <laughs> we don't want to butcher your name, sorry. Carol Helwig from Charleston. Bob Inyard from Charleston, one of our storytellers. Don from Charleston. James Calvert from Ashmore. And the Don family called all the way from Las Vegas. They're wow. watching online right now. Tom and Sue Bartlein from Las Vegas. They wanted us to know how much it meant to the Dom family that WEIU is doing a story like this. Oh. It was our pleasure, all our pleasure. Yeah. And so right now, we were trying to get up to 25 calls. We are at 32. All right. So thank you so much for calling. So now, the challenge is, let's get to 50. Absolutely, so and you can do it. So let's get calls coming. Uh, we know you love the program. We have so many people here in the studio that are anxious to talk to you and talk to me. And so let's get on with that, too. Let's get on with it. You have the opportunity to give your gift to WEIU tonight. All you have to do is pick up your cell phone, pick up any type of device. <laughs> give us a call that you need to. The operators are standing by, and they are storytellers. I'll tell you what, they want to hear from you because that's a thank you to them for doing what they did. And what's funny, when they come in, they're kind of nervous about getting on the phone. Once those phones start getting lit up, they are excited. They are it's excited. Fun. And you know what? I've got a storyteller right over here who is excited to share his story with us. This is Mark Hudson, and Mark is um, a storyteller for Pemberton Hall. And there's something very special about that story. Well, it certainly is. The, the fact that Eastern um, was the first residential university amongst the State University of Illinois is pretty special. Livingston Lord had a vision, came to Illinois, tried to convince the legislature it's a good idea. Imagine that, the legislature not recognizing a good idea. And um, he convinced them after uh, six years of trying to finally do it. And 27 years after Illinois State and U of I were uh, college campuses, Eastern led the way to become a residential campus, and they all followed after that. Isn't that something? And I'll tell you what, Eastern is still leading the way today, and we're proud to be part of Eastern Illinois University. We are licensed through the university, and we want to thank those people who are licensing us. We are 
we're something special around here, and I want to thank you tonight for being a part of this show. Well, it's a great program. You guys have done a great job of capturing the spirit of Charleston, and I'm excited to be here, and I know all the fellow storytellers are as well, so thank you so much for having us. Thank you for being a part of it, and it, you made it easy for us. Well, my, our pleasure. Thank you, and Jana, back to you. Thank you, Mark and, Mark and Ken. We really appreciate his story. We hope that you enjoyed the story on Pemberton Hall as well. I have somebody really close to me. He works here at WIU. His name is Ramin, and he's got a few things to say about John Dom. So come on in here. And Ramin, tell us a little bit about John Dom and your connection with him. Well, I uh, am a, been a member of the Charleston Community Band for 20 years. And uh, one of the funny things about uh, being a part of the Charleston Community Band is that I am a trombone player, and so was John Dom. And one of our favorite pieces to play, we probably played it once a season, was Lassus Trombone. Okay. Basically, it was a trombone piece, featured the trombone section. And after years pass on by, the trombone section would uh, joke around and say, it's time to play Lassus Trombone. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other uh, memories of, of him or anything of, that honored him or something you'd want to share too? Well, one thing that wasn't in the uh, story that we saw that Ginger Stanfield did a great job telling at John Dom's funeral, uh, a few select few of us were asked to play at his, at his funeral. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you there was not a dry eye there as we played some uh, very John Dom-ish uh, music, um, some up-tempo, just a wide variety. And at the very end of it, uh, the Dom family walked over to us and gave us a standing ovation. Wow. And uh, that told you right there. You know, brought it all home, you know, what, you know, what we thought of John Dom and his family. And uh, it was a pleasure and still is a, proud to be a, a member of the Charleston Community Band. Thank you, Ramin, very much. We are, we are so glad that we can share stories like that with our viewers. John Dom was definitely a very special man in our community and loved by so many. And the Dom family, like they called in and they said, you know what, we love WEIU, we love what you're doing. So if you're out there right now and you've seen some stories that you think, you know what, I have learned something tonight. I want to pass this DVD on, D on to our family or friends. Give us a call. We're trying to get up to 50 right now, and I don't even know where we are. We're, we got some lines open, so let's give Bridget a call. We've got several people that need to be called right now. If you've been watching tonight and this story has touched you in any way, if it spoke to you, we want you to call right now. We want you to support the television station that's doing the program on Charleston. If WEIU doesn't do it as a public broadcasting station, who's going to do it? And the answer to that is probably no one. This is what we're here to do. We're a part of your community. We're a part. Eastern and Charleston are, are bound together. We are one, and we are excited that we can bring a program about Charleston and touch on Eastern as well. Kian, come on over. Let's talk some more. Are you well, going to talk to somebody? I'm going to talk okay. to somebody over here, and then I'll come talk to you in <laughs> okay. just a moment. We'll just be that way. <laughs> I've got a very important person here that I want to talk to, and this is Rosie Inyer. I talked to your dad just a little bit ago, and his daughter Rosie is in the story. Um, too, and she spoke about St. Charles Church. And I wanted to ask you, Rosie, what was it like being a storyteller? Tell me about your experience. You know, all of you girls and guys made it a really easy experience. I was very nervous to begin with, but it was an honor. It was a, a, a huge honor to be able to tell the story of St. Charles and just to be a part of all of this about about Charleston. And it was especially neat though to be know that my dad was doing it too. And um, so it was it was a really neat experience. I, I was very honored to be able to be able to do it. I hope I, I hope I brought <laughs> that the church got to see you know what it what it's all about from the standpoint of what they thought it was going to be so, absolutely yeah. I think yeah. there are a lot of people watching your story tonight a lot of people know you you have a lot of friends and family out there yeah and what a yeah. great story yeah. to tell yeah. tonight and yeah. share yeah so all my friends and family need to call in call in and get a get a DVD that's yeah. right thank you so much Rosie okay. that's what we want to hear tonight well I'll tell you what we've got a lot of special people in the studio tonight all of our storytellers we've got some other volunteers who have helped us out before. The phones are getting a little silent right now, so I want you to give us a call right now. And I'm joining Jane mm -hmm. again because we are pitching to you tonight. Mm -hmm. We need to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Without your support, we cannot continue to offer programs like this. We cannot continue to support the community. It is you helping us to mm -hmm. support the community, and we work together as a team. That's right, Ken. Talking about a team, we've got some people here to thank that are joining our team. They're, we've got a lot of calls from outside of Charleston, but let's start with Charleston. Uh, Tammy and Phil Hutton. I know their sister, the sister did a story for us, Debbie. She did a great job. 
uh, Jared Dom from Webster, Texas. Wow. He's watching online, obviously, so thank you. And that's another Dom child, I'm, I'm sure. Um, yeah. We have somebody that called from Washington, D.C. I'm sure they're watching online as that's well. That's crazy. Hey, uh, yes. Mark Eads, thank you so much for calling in. Susan Tinder from Charleston. Thank you, Susan. Merle and Max White. And they live in Coles, they lived in Coles County in 1950. They're calling from Sydney tonight. So thank you so much wow. for tuning in. Larry Stuffel, all the way from Springfield. Thank you, Larry. And Nancy and Jim Derman, they're from San Antonio, Texas. Right. Yeah. This is awesome. Woo! Awesome. What that's great that people are actually going online. They're going to WEIU.net. If you're here and you know somebody out of the state, call them right now. Call us first and donate and then call them and say go to WEI.net and look look what we're, they're doing here tonight. We're preserving the history of Charleston. I'll tell you what, technology is a wonderful thing because you can share so many ways these days. We can share online, we can share through social media, so be sure to get on and post or tweet mm -hmm. or whatever you need to do and get people excited about tuning in. We have several more stories to share with you tonight. The stories that we have heard so far have been wonderful. Mm -hmm. We've heard about um, Pemberton Hall like we talked about and that photo, I'll tell you what, <laughs> of those girls looking down mm -hmm. and then the recreation of that, that mm -hmm. was really something special. It was. It was. Our goal is 50, so right now we are prob probably at maybe 440. We have three open lines. We got three open, open lines. lines, so let's get those phone lines. We need no to get phone. to the 50. We did it last segment, so let's get the 50. Who's going to be the next one to call? Let's get the phone operators busy. That's right, and I'll tell you what, WEIU is your public broadcaster, and without your help, we would not be able to do this. And I'll tell you what, when you're, when you're calling in and these people get to talk to you, they get to share those comments with us, and we want to talk about those things. I had someone post me earlier on Facebook and said, what a job well done, and she's someone who called in with a donation tonight as well. And then I had somebody send me a picture of growing up with one of our storytellers. So it's amazing what mm -hmm. stories are doing with people and, mm -hmm. and how far out they're reaching mm -hmm. tonight. It's crazy. Laura Hussey from Charleston. Thank you, Laura. Charmaine Owen, she's one of our storytellers. Right. Uh, uh, oh, we have a Carbosion. And Ramin's father called in tonight. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Eddie, so much. Uh, I'm telling you what, people are getting excited. We're getting excited here because when you call, that's telling us something awesome. That's telling us you like WEIU, you, you like what we're doing as a public broadcaster, and you appreciate the history of Charleston. And, and where else Let's can you call busy. tonight and get a copy of something so mm -hmm. very special? You can keep it for yourself. You can give it as a gift. The holidays are coming up mm -hmm. soon, and what a great gift to give somebody in your family. Right there on your screen, you get a copy of a book that has been written by mm -hmm. someone very special. She was one of our storytellers, the very first one you saw tonight, and you can get that with a copy of the program. Mm -hmm. too. And what we're saying about the book, it's a really, really heavy book. It's right here. So for us to mail this would be really, really expensive. So if you're calling from Charleston, you can come and pick it up at the station. As soon as next week, you give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. And I'll tell you what, the DVD, you can keep around and you can have viewing parties later for people who may not have been able to tune in tonight. You can share that with them or you can ask them, hey, you can call in and get your own copy as well. Or you can get online and you can get a copy as well. You can get two at 120 or you can get one for 75 and we're giving you a deal at the 120 level so you may be able to keep one and give one away as well and you know what somebody's done several people said can I can I have the Matt Toon one as well we already did Matt Toon and they're like we want one of each so that we can do that as well if you want what we can just get two for the 120 and we can split up the towns so it doesn't matter that's right and this is all about Charleston tonight but we have done a couple of other cities around a couple of other mm -hmm. local towns so if you are interested in those be sure to tell one of our mm -hmm. phone operators Look but tonight we're we're looking through that book right there. It is full of history. It's called Downtown Around the Square. Um, Nancy Easter Schick has offered these to us as uh, gifts and it is not just about the square. There is so much rich history in there and some of that history has been brought out through the stories that are being shared tonight. You know, if you're one of those people and you're calling right now, tell the phone operator, you know, tell them how much you appreciate WEIU. We're definitely gonna give a thank you, shout out to you. We got a couple phones, two more, we've only got two more minutes to get to our 50. And right now we got some phone operators. Mark Hudson's just waiting and Rosie and Sharon and Kayla, they're waiting for somebody to give them a call. 
Who's going to be the next person to give to WEIU and to support Charleston? This is our story. I'll tell you what, if anybody knows Rosie or Mark right there, give them a call. They're wanting to answer the phone and talk to you. Mark is uh, an Eastern employee. We know a lot of people know who he is. And Rosie has been a part of the community mm -hmm. for many years. So what and happens is our phones roll. So once mm -hmm. we get them filled up, yeah. then they'll roll back over here. So we need more people to call in right now. Don't wait any longer. Mm -hmm. Call right now. And there's some people that are calling and they're saying, I want to talk to Mark. Well, that's okay. He'll get up and go to the phone. So that's we'll, right. we'll do switches. That's fine. Switch We're around. Fun. Whatever it takes to, to let people know we thank you and we appreciate your support. We'll we got one minute. We'll get back to the program in one minute. We have more stories to share with you tonight. But I'll tell you what, if we can make that goal, we've got about, what, six, nine more to go? We've got eight more to go. Eight more to go. To get okay. us to 50. So Fill who's going to be? Fill up the phone banks right now. Let's do a phone blitz. Let's get this over with so we can get back to our show. That's right. Be superheroes tonight and support the storytellers in your community. We have Ginger on the phone. We have Bridget and we have Kayla over here. But we have five operators open right now. So if you want an opportunity to call in, be sure mm -hmm. to do it right now. Have somebody called from Decatur, John Dom Jr. Hey. Mr. Very hey. awesome. Thank you. Elaine Holt from Charleston. Thank you so much. Jay and Brooke Ferguson from Charleston. Thank you so much. Gerilyn McElwee and Sean Veach. Awesome. Thank you, girls. Joanne and Doug Meyer from Charleston. Thank you so much. Mary Walker from Lerna. And last but not least, Jan Hawkins from Charleston. Yes. We're at 46. We still need to get up with that 50, so keep on calling. Give us a call right now. The number is at the bottom of your screen. We have a couple of operators who are standing by. Ginger wants to talk to you. Mark and Rosie, they're still waiting for you. you got to <laughs> we got to talk to them tonight. They've got something to say. Yes, they do. Both of them do. And they are feeling left out. So give them a call. The number's on your screen. We would love to talk to you. And don't go anywhere. We'll be in here answering phones, Keep whether on the calling. program's on or whether we're on break. So the number's at the bottom of your screen right now. Write it down, and we'll be back to the show.